Greetings, church family. I hope this update finds you well. This is the update for the Wednesday, April 29th. Uh, I want to begin by letting you know how the elders feel about you all by reading from Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will, be, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Then he says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, for you are all partakers with me of grace. And that's exactly how we feel as well. You are partners with us in the gospel, partakers with us of God's grace. We miss you and we think of you constantly and pray for you. And we all have needed much grace, have we not? The grace to think biblically, grace to respond biblically to our circumstances, to our experiences, to our frustrations and, and trials, and to our blessings. I just want to remind you that remember that God's grace is given to us freely in Christ, but it's mediated through me to various means, be being strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. But that grace comes how? By the Word of God. Be reading, be praying, be meditating, be listening. It comes to us through prayer, interacting with God, interaction with one another, which I know is limited, but still our spiritual gifts can be conveyed through phone conversations. So be being strengthened by God's grace, but remember to pursue it. We are partakers of it. We are partners in it. We need it daily. So continue to press into the Lord. Now, one way that you have responded to grace as partakers, co-workers in the gospel, has been your giving. So I want to update you on the status of giving in April. You may remember I mentioned that our monthly budget is about 104000 April came in at 94000 so that's about $10,000 short but a, for April. But I've been told that that's pretty typical, that dip at this time of year. And year to date, we're actually still a little bit ahead. So praise the Lord for that. And I thank you for that as well. Uh, some asked and made mention of the fact that that uh, if, if, if there's a little bite taken in the giving online, how much is that? It's about 2% or something, but you could also make up for that. I think there's a link there that you could follow and add that to your gift if you like. The, the big announcement this week is really about communion in this update. You remember I mentioned that we'd be talking about it and that we have prayed over this, we've wrestled over this because we're watching how long is this going to go on and so forth. A lot of pros and a lot of cons. Uh, they're both theological and practical. I won't go through all of those, but basically where we landed was the mutual recognition that extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. Well, I don't think anyone would argue whether or not this is an extraordinary time. And so uh, we've decided to move ahead at least once to experiment with an online communion service and begin to test the waters. Uh, I want to stress, though, again, this is only a temporary measure, and we're not sure where we'll go with this. Uh, allow me to provide some guidelines for you, four bullet points to be thinking about as we move forward with uh, online communion. The first one I think is a pretty obvious one, and that is that all the ordinary parameters for communion continue to apply. And what are those? That's faith in Christ, confession of our sin to the Lord, and uh, being at peace with other believers. Faith in Christ, first of all, right? All who come to the table are offered the bread and cup, regardless of their age per se, or their depth of knowledge or of theology, but not regardless of their spiritual condition. They must be in Christ. They must have exercised faith in Christ. So, parents, this will be one time when then you'll, uh, once again, need to carefully explain this to your children because we won't be around as much to do that for you. So take time to consider that. If you think they have come to faith, they really should have been baptized. And if not, you need to explain that to them. And of course, we'll be doing that at a later time. Faith in Christ, confession of sin to the Lord. You know, when we approach the Lord in worship, we approach a God who knows everything about us. And so we need to approach with transparent honesty. Uh, a sense of, uh, of authenticity and integrity with Him. We're not confessing sin in, in order to be made right with God. We are right with God. We confess knowing that we, that we have an advocate with the Father and that He will cleanse us from our sins. We confess our sins for relational restoration with God and primarily in our own conscience to, to not keep going further down this path of thinking we're fooling God. 
So be transparent. Confess your sin to the Lord. And lastly, um, we come uh, being at peace with other believers. We seek reconciliation, relational reconciliation, not only with our Father in heaven, but with one another. And I know you can't be with everyone, but you could call someone with, with, uh, to settle something if you're not at peace with them. So those things are part of the ordinary parameters. And we ask you to remember them. And then uh, on a practical note, prepare things ahead of time. Prepare the elements ahead of time. Don't make this a sort of last minute dash into the kitchen to grab whatever's out there, you know. Set the elements out in front of you. Be ready. And what elements should, should you use when Jesus and the disciples uh, met? They inaugurated, or Jesus, to speak properly, he inaugurated the Lord's Supper on the very last Passover. And so that means that they were drinking wine and unleavened bread. Uh, various traditions approach this uh, differently, but among Protestants, we Protestants have employed all sorts of bread, be they leavened or unleavened, and be they uh, whole bread or be they wafers of some kind. You know, what about uh, what about the drink? What about the fruit of the vine? Well, traditionally, it was always alcoholic wine. It wasn't until the temperance movement here in the late 1800s in America that grape juice became common. Now, we're not trying to bind your conscience on this on any level at all, uh, and, uh, and on matters like that, you know, alcoholic or non-alcoholic fruit juice of some kind, I think, would be just fine. What we are hoping to do is set some parameters and say, don't be flipping about it, and then, you know, later post something on Facebook or some how fun it was to have a burger and beer during communion. That doesn't help anybody. Uh, it, it confuses people and it doesn't help our unity and our consistency. So that's, just let that be an encouragement to you. Prepare the ele elements ahead of time. Thirdly, maintain a worshipful atmosphere. Uh, just as I mentioned last week that giving can become rote. It's up to you since you don't have the body around you. Uh, we're not all singing together. Uh, it's up to you in the same way to maintain a worshipful attitude at home. That means keeping your kids under control. That means telling them ahead of time what's happening and help them learn some respect for this. Number four, I want to say that this will be limited to live stream only, the communion part of the service. Participating at a later time all by yourself, you know, that would truly be a sort of self-administered communion in total isolation. For us, online communion is already an extraordinary measure, but having it later all by yourself, I think, is maybe pushing uh, it one step uh, too far for us. So we've asked Ben to not include the communion portion uh, of the service when he posts it afterwards. So those four, that's the four bullet points. All the ordinary parameters for communion continue to apply. Prepare the elements of head, ahead of time. Be thoughtful about that, respectful, maintain a worshipful atmosphere as well as you can, and then this should be, will be limited to live stream only. So, will this minister to us? Or will this in some way lead to confusion and erode our appreciation of the Lord's table? Well, I don't know. We really need to hear from you on that. We'll be looking for your thoughts, uh, giving us your insight as to you know, how, how this affected you. Um, let me talk a little bit for a moment about the pulpit. I want to say that we'll be finishing uh, the great book of Daniel uh, in, in maybe two weeks. I know there's three chapters left, and, and they're all quite long, but chapters 10 through 12 are all about one single climactic visionary experience that Daniel had towards the end of his life. And chapter 11 in particular is just filled with dizzying details about historical events and battles and, and, and interactions between leaders that uh, I, I'm just not going to get into all those details to try and explain them. It's not a history class, not a Bible history class. This is a sermon. So I'm going to try and keep this cohesive as much as I can over one to two weeks here. So uh, here's something to think about. Read all three chapters in one sitting if you can. Chapters 10 through 12. And maybe you'll, then you'll get a sense of how this is all really all tied together. So this will be the one time I will say dare to be a Daniel and persevere, endure. Try and read those three chapters together and then be praying for me as we come to try and finish the book of Daniel. I want to finish with prayer requests and they're primarily for uh, your church elders, leaders, and servants. And number one, pray for the church for continued generosity in 2020 so that all the planned and budgetary ministry initiatives aren't deferred and mercy can continue to be extended. Uh, 
Uh, number two, pray for wisdom for the leaders of the church so as to manage and plan in an uncertain economic environment. We just don't know where things are going. And we need to be wise about decisions we make regarding expenditures. Thirdly, pray for wisdom for the elders as we evaluate or reevaluate the online communion service as we hear your input. Uh, fourth, pray for wisdom for the elders as we reevaluate our collective response to the limitations that are being imposed by the government. I want to be careful here, so I'm going to read it very, very, very straightforward here. There is a collective unrest uh, not only being felt, as I know you are feeling it, but also being expressed by various sectors of our society, including churches, but not exclusive to churches. And so as the government continues to unroll and redefine limitations, and there's different ones from one state to another, there's, there's a growing unrest, and our response needs to always be reevaluated. Decisions like this can't be emotional beloved. Decisions like these need to be based on fact and principle, and we need to have them both. And, and, and sometimes we, we fear our government officials are making decisions that don't have both. So we need to be sure that we're making the right decisions. And so we ask that you pray for us as we continue to evaluate uh, where this is all going. I've been talking with some pastors who are also feeling the same way uh, and, and trying to develop a discussion about this, at least here in our state, in particular here in the, in the Bay, Bay Area. Lastly, this leads right from that. Because of that, you should pray for our leaders, our government leaders. If you have never seriously done that, get on your knees and pray for their salvation. Uh, pray that they would see their sin, they would see their need for a re redemption, and they would see the solution in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Pray that, uh, that false teaching doesn't get into their head. Pray that God would do a great thing and, and open their eyes to the gospel. And then pray that God would give them a measure of wisdom beyond their capacities, that they would make just and fair decisions on how they apply these things and how they react, that they would have the fact before them as they make decisions you know don't just get all built up and full of steam beloved pray for these people just as Daniel did when he was in exile for Nebuchadnezzar and the other leaders that that followed him well I leave you with all that I hope again overall you're encouraged and that you're finding the grace of God to be sufficient the Lord be with you all